So we're going to talk some actual chemistry now. Um, you won't need any chemicals this week, but next week we are going to need, you're going to either need the kit or, uh, for those of you who weren't here, this kit is a kit of 49 different um, natural isolates and essential oils. It's for the people that are taking the home study course. And there's people all over the world that want to take this course. I don't know why, but they do. And so they want, I mean, this kit sells for $4.99. For but I'm making it available to the students for half that price, $2.50. Um, if you don't want to buy the kit, that's fine. What we're going to do is basically bring each week the uh, relevant oils and isolates and you can actually make little vials. They won't be as big as these, and you won't have a box. Um, but you have to label them and everything yourself. For your own smelling reference, you'll need these to take home with you because a good part of this course is actual odor evaluation. You're going to need to be able to smell a component and tell what it is, or smell an oil and identify it just based on your smell. Uh, that's huge. And that ability to be able to do that is the deal breaker for going into this industry. Um, so, one way or another, we'll get those to where you can do that because you're going to need to be able to do that at home and practice. Where would we go to buy this kit? Um, just tell me, and I'll. I, these are sold through the Central University. Okay. Yeah. And we'll make it so. You have an opportunity to get the kit at half price if you want it. That's just basically break even. So that's, I know students are tapped for money, but I'm not going to sell them at a loss. <laughs> um, it will be, you know, if you have the kit, it just makes it nice because you have the whole um, the key with the structures of the molecules. And see, I've, I've grouped these into seven basic groups of chemicals in essential oil chemistry. And I don't, you know, some other people may have different classifications. These are just what I have determined to be the most useful. So, in getting into the chemistry aspect of things, um, just be aware that next week we will start to get into some smelling and uh, and that's going to be a good part of your grade and being able to identify. So it's a very different class than what you've probably ever had. Before we get into these seven different chemical classes that are relevant to essential oil chemistry, I want to talk a little bit about some background stuff. Now for most of you, this is going to be very rudimentary, basic, and you're not going to need to take any notes at all because it's very simple stuff that you already know as a third year chemistry student or biochemistry student. <laughs> but if you feel compelled to just make the conversation more interesting, feel free to interrupt. Um, and I'm not going to, um, on this basic chemistry part, I'm not going to be writing a lot. I will make this section of the notes available online for download so that you can have, because like I said, most of you are not going to need this, but I'm just going to just talk briefly over it. Um, things, simple things like matter is composed of molecules, you know? and hopefully everyone in here knows what a molecule is. If you don't, then it's explained in a little more detail in the notes we'll be getting. <laughs> Um, molecules are composed of two or more atoms. Atoms are the smallest particle of a particular element that can exist. The most important atoms or elements in organic chemistry are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Atoms consist of three types of subatomic particles. Protons have a positive charge located in the nucleus of the atom. It's the number of protons or the atomic number which identifies a particular atom. Neutrons are about the same size as protons, have no charge and are also located in the nucleus. Atoms with the same number of protons and electrons but different numbers of neutrons are termed isotopes. Hopefully you're familiar with that term. 
Electrons have negative charge and exist in various orbitals around the nucleus. In neutral atom, the number of electrons must equal the number of protons. Okay, all basic stuff. Now, the chemistry of matter can be divided into, further divided into subcategories, organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry. Um, inorganic chemistry is chemistry mostly uh, compounds that don't contain carbon. But in here, we're concerned obviously with organic chemistry uh, or carbon containing molecules. Um, you know, and then we go through, this is all background stuff that I would cover in more detail in like a more rudimentary course that assumes no chemical background. You know, and I do that too for like a home study course. So we go on to talk about law of constant composition. Chemical properties of any atom are determined only by the number and arrangement of its electrons. Uh, chemical re reactions involve only the electrons of the atoms or molecules participating. Again, all this stuff, there may be one or two questions in somewhere that you'll know the answers to this if you're a chemistry major. Um, chemical bonds, we have chemical bond, or covalent bonding, which is basically what we're going to be talking about in here, organic molecules and covalent bonding, as opposed to ionic compounds, which has a little bit of a role in all of this, but not a whole lot, okay? Um, and then we go on to talk about uh, the atomic number, atomic mass, how to calculate molecular weight, which I'll expound upon more later. Uh, electronegativity and polarity. I'll hit that a little bit later. But what I want to talk about right now is what is important in essential oil chemistry. What elements are important? Real simple. If, you're, if you've taken other advanced chemistry courses, this is going to make your life so much simpler. Because really, in essential oil chemistry, ninety-nine point nine percent of the time. We're only concerned with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So if you know these three elements, and you know, we want to know their atomic weight, Free, let me make a little better table here. And it's bonding pattern, that's really uh, going to carry you a long way in the simple things that we do in essential oil chemistry. I'm going to throw in here nitrogen as well, but just realize that carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Now let me let me go from simplest to more. Hydrogen, carbon, to oxygen. Is the bulk of this, and then nitrogen a little bit. And then sulfur too, but I'm not even going to talk about that. So, simplest is hydrogen, atomic weight one. Bonding pattern is one bond two other atoms. Always one bond other atoms. Right? Um, only in single bonds, obviously. Because you can only have one bond. 
Carbon has an atomic weight of 12. And its bonding pattern is four bonds. Always. Oxygen is 16. Two bonds to other atoms. And nitrogen is 14 and three bonds. That's really, you know, the only thing you and commit that to memory, you'll be able to construct from a skeletal structure exactly what's present. Everyone know what I mean when I say a skeletal structure? Basically you're not showing all the atoms and it looks like a skeleton. You'll see that if you don't know what I'm talking about in a minute. Um, so yeah, just these are things you're going to have to remember when we start asking you, you know, some questions concerning structure and things like that. So let's look at, um, for example, the most, the simplest um, organic molecule, a hydrocarbon, let's say, would be carbon. You know the carbon has to have four bonds. And the simplest thing you could do with those four bonds would be to put a hydrogen on each one. And that's methane. These are what, um, these prefixes are also things that you're going to want to commit to memory. The prefix here tells you the number of carbon atoms, and then the ending tells you what class or uh, what type of molecule it is. In this case, A-N-E means it's an alkane which means basically that it doesn't have any double bonds. It's a totally, totally saturated hydrocarbon. So if you go to the next one, which would be two carbons with a carbon-carbon single bond. And if we remember carbon has to have four bonds, so you populate the rest of those sites and you basically sprinkle with hydrogen and you have this is CH4 methane C2H6 which is then ethane F is 2 and so on and so forth will Will, I will require that you memorize all the way up to 12. Okay? So, and the way that goes is so if you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So, 1 is meth, 2 is eth, 3 is prop. Four is bute, five is pent, six is hex, seven is hept, eight oct, nine is non, ten is deck. What's eleven? Undeck. Undeck, yeah. And what about twelve? Dodeck. Dodeck, yeah. And if all these were just straight chain hydrocarbons, they would all end in A and E. So the largest of the series here would be dodecane, undecane, decane, nonane, octane, etc. Everybody's familiar with this, right? Now, <laughs> beyond this, 
you learned in organic chemistry um, how to systematically name molecules through the IUPAC system, right? Well, in essential oil chemistry, you can just throw that out the window. <laughs> Because, <laughs> I mean, it's useful to know that in chemistry in general because from the IUPAC name, you can be given any name of a molecule and from that name derive its structure, right? Well, in essential oil chemistry, all the names of the molecules come from historical things and the products from which they come from. For example, the main component of lime oil is limonene things like that. And that's the names that stick today. No one uses the crazy long IUPAC names. So, but you can't uh, discern the structure from these trivial names, but you can discern most of the time what class of molecule it is from the trivial name because it will still have giveaways to traditional modern chemistry. For example, limonene, it ends in E-N-E, -E, so you know it's a what? Right, alkene, right? There are very few alkanes in, but most of, mostly when we talk about hydrocarbons, there are going to be things that have double bonds. Who has not had, I know some of you haven't, but people that I don't know, who has not had organic chemistry? Anybody in here? Okay, so we should all be good on this. Sorry to bore you if this bores you. I just want to get through it mainly for the online people. But, um, and then we have the, the prefixes that you'll want to be familiar with. Uh, when we talk about substituents, carbon substituents off of a main chain. Um, prefixes to, to tell you how many of, a, of that particular substituent are hanging off the chain. Um, you want to be familiar with, you know, for example, dye equals two, tri equals three, tetra equals four. That's really uh, the most you're going to see in, in essential oil chemistry. You know, I'm sure penta, you know, and it goes on from there, but knowing those two or, or those three is, is good enough. Okay. Any questions to this point? Anybody? You don't have to be, you know, if you're not a chemistry measure, uh, major, just feel free to ask the question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, do a lot of these oils have aromatic structures in them? No. No. <laughs> so, ironically, um, there aren't a whole lot of aromatic, chemically aromatic molecules in this field of aroma chemistry. <laughs> and when we say, uh, for those of you who don't have the chemical background, when we talk about a chemically aromatic molecule, this says absolutely nothing about its aroma, okay? What chemically aromatic refers to is a system of alternating carbon-carbon double bonds in a cyclic planar molecule. For example, the most common uh, example of this would be benzene, right? In which we have a six-membered ring and this is what we call a skeletal structure. Let me read all this. We're not going to show any of the hydrogen, and we're not going to explicitly show any C's for carbons. We just show corners or changes in direction, and at each point 
we assume there's a carbon atom and attached to that carbon atom, if it's not explicitly shown to be oxygen, we know that it has to be hydrogen. So, for example, this carbon atom, the way I have it drawn here, there would be two hydrogen atoms attached to it. But what I'm going to talk about here is chemically aromatic. So the case of benzene, in which we have alternating double bonds, now in this case there would only be now that this carbon has one, two, three bonds, there'd only be one more to a hydrogen, there'd only be one hydrogen here. And same with here, 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 and here. I've satisfied all my bonding rules. Every carbon has four bonds, every hydrogen has one bond. The formula for this is C6H6. Now, when we have this system in a cyclic, so the conditions of aromatic in chemistry are one, has to be cyclic, two, has to be a planar molecule, which you wouldn't know this if you hadn't had organic chemistry, but this is a planar molecule because of the geometry of an sp2 hybridized carbon atom, it has a trigonal planar geometry, yada yada yada, you all know this, uh, and the third condition, it has to be what? Cyclic planar, oh yeah, sorry. Planar, and uh, that's actually then four. Cyclic planar conjugated and then I don't know if they put conjugated in with the planar. I think that might be part of the third of the second rule. Planar and conjugated And by conjugated, that just means you have alternating double bonds. Then the last condition is what? Is it a magic number or something? I can't remember what the number was. Come on, where's our organic chemist? Is it boring plus two? Yes, Huckel rule, right? Huckel rule, which says there must be 4n plus 2 pi electrons. <laughs> Bet you never thought you'd see that again, huh? <laughs> so, in this benzene system, we have basically the second bond of the double bond system are the pi electrons. So we've got two, four, six pi electrons. So 4n, basically you ask yourself, is there an integer I can put in for n such that this would be true? And the answer is yes, n equal 1. Therefore, Huckel rule is satisfied and this is an aromatic molecule. Why they call it aromatic, I'm not really sure of the history behind that. Um, maybe because benzene really did have a powerful aroma. Um, wasn't very, it wasn't good smelling, that's for sure. Um, so there you go. This is, and you don't need to know this, I'm not going to ask, well, I might just ask, you know, something related, but I'm not going to ask you to regurgitate what Huckel rule is, okay? N no one cares about it in this field. But it is necessary to know this because I do classify a subgroup of hydrocarbons called aromatic hydrocarbons, which nobody else does in this field. They, they lump these aromatic hydrocarbons into, in, inappropriately lump them into another group, such as a monoterpene or a sesquiterpene, when actually they are not. And we'll learn more about this. So, that's the only reason I'm talking about this term aromatic in a chemical sense because it is actually a subclass in one of the seven categories. The subclass actually the first category which we'll be talking about next week which will be the hydrocarbons. That is group one and if you have a kit, if you get a kit, each row represents a group, okay? So the top group here is 
the hydrocarbons, and you will get a four examples of the most common types of hydrocarbons in essential oils, and then three examples of oils which contain those hydrocarbons. And so we will smell those individual components and then we'll compare them to the whole oil and you will hopefully be able to smell, yeah, I can smell this component in this whole oil. I can pick it out, you know, and after you get enough experience doing this, you can actually kind of feel even what the level of that component is in the blend. Well, it takes a lot of experience to be able to do that. I've been doing this a while, so I can identify probably about 500 different aroma chemicals just by odor and about 300 or so essential oils. Just give me the blank sample and I can tell you what it is. But that takes a while. And even to some extent, being able to be, tell, oh, that smells like you've got about 15 to 20 percent alpha pinene in this, in this oil, you know, that kind of stuff. Valuable tool to be able to have if you're doing perfumery work or duplication work as a chemist. So then the next group that we will cover uh, will be the alcohols. Again, you'll get four components and three essential oils of these of the alcohol group. Then we'll move on to the ketones. Then we'll move on to the aldehydes. Then we'll move on to the esters. And then the oxides, which are also Oxides, usually, and you've been taught to call them ethers. In um, aroma chemistry or essential oil chemistry, they're usually referred to as oxides. Same thing. If you know what an ether is, you know what an oxide is. Um, and then the last group, I sort of had to come up with this class called mul multiple functionality, which means these are molecules that have multiple functional groups on them. So you can't really call it just an alcohol or just an aldehyde. It could have alcohol, aldehyde, ester, ketone group, all on one mo molecule. So I call those multiple functionality. Another area that no one seems to really classify as such, and they will often get uh, either inappropriately named or totally neglected, and there are some important components in that class. Um, so that kind of gives you a, an overview of where we're heading. Again, next week we will just focus on, on the, um, the hydrocarbon group, and we'll do a lot of smelling. We'll do some systematic naming procedures for hydrocarbons. and. Uh, in more detail. But uh, I hope that you don't get overwhelmed with this and that you enjoy it. Uh, this field has so much diversity in it and once you get into it I think you'll, you won't be bored. Okay? Some of the stuff that we talked about today is a little boring. Once we get into smelling these things and actually talking about them, I think you'll be, you know, three hours will go pop pretty quick, believe it or not. Um, when you think about some of these oils, how lucrative these businesses that make these oils, you just wouldn't believe it. I mean, I have here an example, and I'll pass this around for you to smell. This is an, uh, an oil from Thailand. No, sorry. Yeah, from Thailand. Uh, it's called oud. Oud is also called auger wood, and it's spelled... Auger wood or oud. Now, this oil, the reason I'm showing it to you is because it is one of the most expensive oils in the world um, at anywhere, depending on the quality, uh, between ten and thirty thousand dollars a kilo. This sample right here represents about three hundred dollars worth of oil. Now, the reason this oil is so expensive is because the, you can't just distill agar wood and get the oil. This 
the, the actual oud oil. The wood has to be a fungus infested wood for a certain amount of time, a certain amount of decay, um, because when plants are under attack, this is one of the response mechanisms is to produce these essential oils as a defense mechanism. And so you can only get this quality of oil when the, when the wood is, has this fungus, okay? And it's a very low yield. It's a very powerful oil. Let me just pass it around and take a smell. If you spill it, we'll just put it on your university tab. Um, it, you may not like it. You think, wow, this is so expensive. But in a small, small amount, you would not believe how powerful this oil is. I mean, at a 0.1% concentration in a perfume blend, it's pre you can smell it. And it's very prevalent in Middle Eastern perfumery. It's considered one of the most potent aphrodisiac oils in the world, um, which is why it's so sought after. Are they use that for perfume? Oh, yeah. That stuff stinks. <laughs> I will just tell you, as you get exposed more and more to these different things, it's like a wine appreciation or anything else. The more you learn, the more you will appreciate. And actually, you know, uh, I actually like the smell of that oil. And if you, and there are other oils like it, that when you first smell, having never smelled anything like this, you're going to think, that smells horrible. But as you learn, you will learn to appreciate these things. It's not bad. That's tenacious, so tenacious. You can put that on a scent strip and come back a month later and it'll still smell. So it's, it's got a lot of power. It can add complexity to other things. Yes. In very small amounts, it still has a presence. Yeah, That's so concentrated, too. Yeah. It's a very, very concentrated... Uh, Essential oils are very concentrated liquids. Well, again, it's not going to smell like this at 0.1% in the blend. It adds just a slight nuance that is... Well, it has to be mixed with other things because perfumes are complex mixtures of essential oils and even synthetics. Or, or, but it's, a, it's an art to try to, to do these things. But I promise you, as you smell these and you come back and revisit them later, if, if it's something you have a passion for, you will actually appreciate things like this. There are even notes in perfumery called the fecal note. <clears throat> That is, people want, actually perfumers have certain components, uh, such as the um, civet oil, which is now illegal, which comes from a cat, uh, some, uh, a cat species, that uh, comes from the uh, a gland of this cat that has a fecal note, <clears throat> but it's used in perfumery. There are other fecal notes. Uh, ambergris is an ambergris is a basically whale puke, which is <clears throat> yeah, and some things. Other th there's other ones. Uh, musk. The the true musk comes from the gland of the musk deer. Now that's again another one that's n no longer legal to kill these animals to make these products, but they've come up with s synthetic versions of them and whatnot. And there still is some black market trade of the real stuff. It's very very expensive. Um, but uh, this is, you know, where, like I said, you will get the experience of smelling these things and you may hate something at first and then by the end of the class you may totally turn 180 and actually like something. The reason you hate these natural things at first, some people, is not hate them, but that's a little strong, but maybe you don't like them, is because our culture has become so accustomed to synthetic fragrances, is that's all we know. And people generally like what they're used to when it comes to smelling. Um, and so, for example, if I showed you a rose oil from Bulgaria, a true steam distilled rose oil that cost over $8,000 a kilo, and showed you a $8 a kilo synthetic rose fragrance, most people in here would prefer the cheap rose fragrance. And that's because our noses have been conditioned to like synthetics because that's what's available to us. And we have lost this whole area of natural perfumery that has become too expensive to do on a mass scale in today's world. 
Not to mention, the synthetics aren't going to give you the therapeutic benefit of, of the naturals. So, with that, um, any questions before we actually go on further next week and start getting into smelling? Mm -hmm. So would that have to do with the, like the difference between the synthetic and the natural? Would it just be like the chirality of the compound? That is one aspect, yes, because, um, and we're going to talk, that's one of the sections that we talk about is the complexity of nature. And the um, essential oil, the plant, when it produces, a lot of these molecules have L and D form, which are enantiomers, if you don't know what that term means. Basically, the molecule has a mirror image of itself that is not itself, okay? So you have, a, let's say, your left hand and right hand are mirror images of one another, but you can't superimpose three-dimensionally the left hand onto the right hand. They're different molecules, even though spatially they look identical, but they're just mirror images, and they have all their chemical properties are the same. They have the same boiling point, the same melting point, all the same uh, physical properties except for the way they rotate light plane polarized light. One will rotate light to the right, one will rotate light to the left, and that's pretty much the only physical difference between them, but they will act differently in the body, as we know from medicine. You know, that could be the difference between a, a drug being benign or even, you know, toxic to the person if it has the wrong enantiomer. You know, if you have, um, because the, the way the body works is all how molecules fit. It's a hand and glove type relationship, how the molecule fits into certain receptors. And if, it, and if it's a, a right-handed molecule trying to fit in a left-hand receptor, it's not going to fit. It's not going to work. Well, sometimes this works that way in your nose. And you'll have, for example, um, let's say carvone, L and D carvone. Uh, carvone, L carvone is in dill. It is the main component and the characteristic odor of dill. D-carvone, which is the mirror image molecule, is the characteristic uh, odor of spearmint. So completely different odor, but yet structurally looks almost, you know, they look identical. They're mirror images of one another, but they fit differently inside those receptors and, and create a different odor perception. Now that's not the case in everything. That's one, that's a drastic difference. So is there some that are synthetically reproduced? Yes, images, and that was. But they smell similar. Well, that's what he was uh, hitting upon there, and I didn't. Sorry, I kind of lost track. When a, when we produce, when things are produced on a mass scale in a laboratory, synthetically, typically they don't have control, or it's more expensive to control whether you produce all of one or another of these enantiomers, L or D form. The plant is usually highly specific for one form or another. For example, peppermint oil produces 99.9% L-menthol, okay? But if you make menthol synthetically through a batch bulk process, the cheapest way, you're going to get a 50-50 mixture of L and D menthol in the synthetic form. So, and the, when you get that 50-50 or racemic mixture, that doesn't rotate light at all because it's half one, half the other, and they cancel each other out. And so it's not going to smell the same as the oil that would, or the component that would be 99.9% .9 element on the plant. So, and that's almost always the case in these plants. It's going to be almost all one form or another. So then when you adulterate an essential oil with a synthetic version, um, we, oh, did I forget to turn it on? Yeah. When we adulterate essential oil with a synthetic version, you can completely throw off the therapeutic benefit as well as the odor of it. And so that's one of the reasons why these oils are not successfully completely recreated in a laboratory, is that. Plus, the other reason, and again, we'll hit on this in more detail later, is just the sheer complexity of these things. When you look at an essential oil and you know you see a lot of main components and 30 or so chemicals may make up 99 percent of the oil and then that last one percent is another 300 components and that little one percent makes a big difference in the odor. 
in, the, in what they call the synergistic effect of the overall. So trying to reproduce that complexity in just the sheer number of molecules there and then to get each one of those molecules in the correct enantiomeric ratio would be a phenomenal task to do synthetically, as you might imagine. Any other questions? Well, we want to get out of here early, sir? <laughs> okay.